On June 24, 2000, two motorists traveling along Flamingo Road near Cooper City, Florida, came across a suitcase by the roadside. Inside, they would find the deceased body of a female who was later identified as 35-year-old Kimberly Dietz Livesey. A couple of weeks later, on August 9, 2000, motorists found a duffel bag discarded by the side of a road near Dania Beach, Florida. Inside was the body of Sia Damos. On August 30, 2001, a third body was found in Biscayne Bay in Miami, Florida, and was identified as Jessica Good. Jessica's boyfriend would say she had gone to meet a light-skinned Hispanic man, but never came back. Each of the victims were murdered, and while they were able to collect fingerprints from two of the crime scenes, they were unable to match them to anyone. Their first suspect was Roberto Fernandez, but before he could be arrested, he fled back to Brazil, which does not have an extradition treaty with the United States. In 1996, Fernandez was accused of killing his wife, Danielle Fernandez, in Brazil. On the early morning of November 18, 1996, their neighbors in Londrina, Brazil, were disturbed by a domestic dispute coming from their apartment, which ended after at least six shots were fired. After notifying the police that Fernandez had fled in his car together with his five-year-old daughter, officers soon managed to arrest the 31-year-old licensed pilot. His wife, Danielle, was taken to the hospital but would sadly die of her injuries shortly afterward. The murder shocked the locals, who considered the Fernandezes a nice, wholesome family. But after the murder, it was discovered that the scuffle occurred after she caught Fernandez cheating on her with a call girl. Fernandez alleged that during their fight, Danielle had threatened to shoot him with a revolver, causing him to panic and accidentally kill her using his handgun. However, later, prosecutors revealed that the call girl had come by the police station alleging that Fernandez had attempted to kill her. The woman would say that during her encounter with Fernandez, he started doing drugs and drinking a large amount of alcohol. She said he then started kicking and punching her and even hit her with a water bottle. This eventually spiraled into him attempting to drown her in the motel's bathtub but she managed to free herself and run towards the door. To counter these accusations, Fernandez and his lawyers claimed that his wife had been drunk and acting irrationally while simultaneously trying to discredit the call girl's testimony. In their account, she was the one who had hit him during their encounter. Despite the conflicting physical evidence against Fernandez, he was ultimately acquitted. Following the verdict, it was alleged that his in-laws were so enraged by the outcome that they hired someone to kill him. Supposedly fearing for his life and wanting to leave his past behind, he fled to the United States and settled in Miami, Florida. Between 1996 and 1999, he worked as a bus driver for a touring company and as a flight attendant at the Miami International Airport. During this time, he continued to frequent call girls. Years later, in 2011, fingerprints that were taken from Fernandez following his wife's death matched the fingerprints found at the crime scenes. Also in 2011, DNA from Jessica's crime scene matched the unknown suspect's DNA found at Sia and Kimberly's crime scenes. So, investigators traveled to Brazil in 2011, hoping to talk to Fernandez, only to learn that he possibly died in a plane crash in late 2005 while flying in a Cessna 310 headed from Brazil to Paraguay. However, Broward County investigators felt that Fernandez may have faked his death and wanted to exhume his body to determine if he was truly dead. Nearly a decade later, in late 2020 and early 2021, the body was exhumed, DNA was collected, and it confirmed the remains were, in fact, Roberto Fernandez. Since the DNA linked him to the murders of Sia, Jessica, and Kimberly, they were able to close their cases. However, investigators believe he may have been an active serial killer and could be responsible for other unsolved murders in South Florida and violent crimes against women in Brazil. Jodine Saren was born to Art and Lois Saren and went by Jody. 
Jody suffered from mental disabilities but was able to persevere and she became very active in several social organizations for the mentally disabled. At the age of 39, she was living alone in a condo on the 1900 block of Swallow Lane in Carlsbad, California. While Jody could live by herself, she did depend on her parents for certain things, such as driving her to and from appointments. On Valentine's Day of 2007, her parents went out for dinner and a movie, but Lois couldn't enjoy herself because she kept having an ominous feeling about her daughter. When the movie ended at around 10 p.m., her parents decided they would go by and check on her because she wasn't answering her cell phone. The last time they communicated with her was the night before, and they rarely went an entire day without chatting. When Art and Lois knocked on Jody's front door, they received no answer. The couple attempted to use their spare key to enter the condo, but the chain was on the latch. They noticed that all the lights were on and called her name, but once again received no answer. Art forced the door open as their concern grew, ultimately breaking the lock. As they entered the condo, they went to her bedroom and pushed open the door. It was here that they found a man on top of Jody in her bed. Concerned that the stranger was taking advantage of his daughter, Jody's father told him to get dressed, and he and his wife quickly went to another part of the condo. They weren't sure at the time if they had interrupted Jody and a possible boyfriend, but her parents waited in the living room to allow their daughter a moment of privacy, expecting an embarrassed couple to emerge from the bedroom. While they waited, they happened to notice a pair of men's tennis shoes sitting inside the door of the condo as if she had asked someone to take them off. After about 10 minutes had passed and there was still no movement coming from the bedroom, Art and Lois knocked on Jody's bedroom door. After receiving no answer, they slowly opened it and to their shock, the man was gone and Jody lay motionless on her bed. Art grabbed Jody placed her on the floor and began CPR, but it was too late. She was already cold and was later determined to have died at least 10 hours earlier by blunt force trauma to the head and was strangled to death. An investigation of the crime scene could not uncover the killer's entry or exit point. No windows in the bedroom had been broken or forced open and there was no sign of forced entry at the door. Despite this, investigators refused to rule out a forced entry. As for an exit point, after Art and Lois left the bedroom, they went to a section of the condo where they couldn't see the bedroom door or the front door, indicating that the killer could have snuck out unnoticed. Nothing appeared to be missing, ruling out a robbery gone wrong. Unknown male DNA was found at the crime scene, but there were no matches in CODIS but it was sufficient enough to identify someone if they were to ever get a match. A neighbor of Jody, Samantha Raymond, would tell police that she saw a man running down an embankment near her apartment on the night that Jody was murdered, but she didn't get a good description of him. There was a lot of speculation that Jody had willingly opened the door for her killer, implying that it could have been someone she knew. Also, Art told police that he thought he recognized the man as somebody Jody knew through her circle of disabled friends. He said that if it was this man, he didn't have a car and used public transportation or sometimes rode a bicycle. When the man was identified, he provided a DNA sample, but it didn't match the DNA found at the crime scene and he was ruled out. A decade would go by with little to no suspects. Then in 2017, Parabon Nano Labs was able to transform the DNA from the crime scene into a digital image of the suspect. This process, known as phenotyping, predicts an unknown suspect's likely description. According to its analysis, the suspect had fair to light skin, green or blue eyes, blonde or brown hair, and some freckles. He was likely in his 30s to 40s and of Northern European descent. In addition, according to Art and Lois, he was a heavyset man with a large stomach and messy hair. In November 2018, using forensic genealogy, the suspect was finally identified as David Mabriot. However, they were never able to arrest him because he committed suicide in 2011, four years after the murder. Mabriot was a married man with a son who lived a transient lifestyle and had an addiction to meth. He was unwilling to keep a job, lived in and about the area, and had relatives that lived locally. 
His family never knew of the real monster that was David Mabriot. You can clearly see this in his obituary where his family speaks of him as a loving and selfless individual and said that he would live on forever in the hearts of those fortunate enough to have had him in their lives. Thankfully, his mother and son cooperated with the investigation. Shockingly, Mabriot had once been a potential suspect in a robbery. During the interrogation, officers asked if they could take his picture and collect his DNA, which he agreed to. He turned out not to be the suspect in the robbery, but his DNA was never entered into CODIS by the Oceanside Police Department. His DNA sat there all this time, and if it had been entered, he could have been caught soon after the murder and could have given Jody justice and her family some much-needed answers. Investigators don't know if Jody and Mabriot knew each other, but they don't believe so. The Saren family said they were forever grateful to the Carlsbad Police Department for their outstanding efforts in attaining justice in this tragic case. In late 1977, Jane Antunes was a divorced mother of a 13-year-old daughter and was living with her parents in Atascadero, California, while her daughter was living with her father in Oregon. On November 17, 1977, at 7.30 p.m., Jane was on her way to her best friend's home but would never arrive. A witness would later say they saw her pick up an unidentified man in her gold Datsun. The next day, Jane's brother David became concerned when she never arrived home and never made it to her friend's house. Later that day, while searching for Jane, David found his sister in the back seat of her car alongside a dirt road just a mile from her home. She had been bound, sexually assaulted, and suffered a fatal throat wound. Unfortunately, Jane's family had already suffered a tremendous loss in 1965 when Jane's teenage sister died in a car accident. On January 11, 1978, less than two months after Jane was found murdered, the body of another woman was discovered only a few miles away from where Jane was found. 28-year-old Patricia Dyer was found murdered on the floor of her home by a friend who came by to visit. She had been sexually assaulted and stabbed with a knife from her kitchen drawer. Patricia worked at the Atascadero State Hospital and lived on Del Rio Road. She had told a friend that she was going to the grocery store and then going home to clean. Friends would say that Patricia would have never allowed a stranger into her home, but they said she always kept a key under the mat outside her front door. This is most likely how the killer gained entry. In both murders, the victim's arms had been bound behind their backs with bindings found at the scene. Because of the similarities, the original case investigators suspected the murders were linked. While the victims did not know each other, they had mutual friends, and both were known to frequent the Tally Ho Bar in Atascadero. Additionally, Jane's brother knew Patricia through work. Investigators at the time suspected that Arthur Rudy Martinez, a parolee living in the area, could have possibly been involved. Martinez moved to the area in May 1977, six months before Jane's murder. He was working in a nearby welding shop after serving time for attempted murder and sexual assault 10 years earlier, but there was never any direct evidence linking him to the crimes. After Patricia's murder, Martinez fled to Spokane, Washington, where he was once again arrested for a string of robberies and two sexual assaults. While Martinez was a strong suspect, investigators had little evidence to work with. He was given a life sentence in late 1978, but escaped prison in 1994 and lived under an assumed name in the Fresno area for 20 years. Though the murder cases had stalled, investigators continued to follow leads as DNA technology advanced. They always suspected that Jane and Patricia were murdered by the same person, but were unable to confirm this until 2005. That's when the suspect's DNA was entered into a DNA database and confirmed their theory. While they were able to determine that the DNA from both cases matched, they were unable to determine who the actual suspect was because the database returned no matches. 
Finally, in 2017, a cold case unit detective examined the case once again and used evidence from the crimes to create a familial DNA search. This DNA search would lead them right to a familiar suspect, Arthur Martinez. However, they quickly learned that Martinez had died in 2014, just two months after he turned himself in, 20 years after he escaped custody. He only did this because he had been diagnosed with terminal cancer and thought he would receive better treatment while incarcerated. But detectives still needed his DNA to prove he was the killer. So they located his ex-girlfriend that he lived with years earlier in Fresno. To the detective's surprise, the ex-girlfriend still possessed an old razor of his that had remained in her medicine cabinet all those years. It still contained Arthur's DNA, and it matched the DNA found at both crime scenes. In addition, investigators once again interviewed a witness who saw a man walking from the scene of Jane's murder. This same witness was instrumental in helping the original investigators develop a sketch of the suspect. The witness wasn't made aware of the DNA match and had been shown numerous photos over the years, but never a photo of Martinez. When she was finally shown a photo of Martinez, she immediately identified him as the man she saw the night of the murder. 41 years later, San Luis Obispo County Sheriff announced publicly in April 2019 that the killer had been identified and he was responsible for the deaths of both Jane Antunez and Patricia Dyer. Mavis Kindness Boots Nelson was a tribal member of the Yakima Nation. At the age of 56, Mavis was living in Seattle, Washington, had three adult children, and was described as a kind and fun-loving individual. She worked the front desk at the Compass Housing Alliance in Plymouth Housing, which provides services to homeless people. On May 19, 2022, shortly after 10 p.m., Mavis used the rideshare lift to go home from a friend's house in Auburn, Washington. On her way home, she called a man named Charles Becker. The two would first meet at Mavis's apartment, and then they left together and headed for Becker's apartment. This was the last time Mavis was ever seen alive. On June 20th, Mavis was found on a green belt in the Kincaid Ravine near Ravina Avenue Northeast and Northeast 45th Street on the University of Washington's campus. When Mavis's older sister, Morning Owl, was notified of her sister's death, it came as quite a shock because she didn't even know Mavis was missing. When investigators asked Morning Owl about Charles Becker, she said she was unfamiliar with him, but assumed he was just a mutual friend or someone she could party with. It was also discovered that Mavis was in a relationship with a man, but that man was not Becker. During the investigations, detectives would discover that the last place Mavis's phone pinged was near where Becker lived. Typical Yakima tribal funerals consist of burying the deceased within three days of their death. They also hold a dressing service in which they dress the deceased in a buckskin outfit with a viewing procession afterward. However, Morning Owl was tasked with the decision to either honor their traditions or allow the authorities to retain Mavis's body for further investigation. She reluctantly agreed to let investigators retain her body, and luckily she did because they were able to obtain DNA from her killer. When the DNA was tested, it linked right back to 32-year-old Charles Becker. Becker admitted that the two had shared drinks on the night she disappeared, but denied killing her. Instead, Becker claims Mavis mysteriously died before storing her body in a closet. However, authorities weren't buying this story because Mavis was found with numerous stab wounds. He was then arrested for her murder. This was not the first time that Becker had had a run-in with the law. In 2016, he was convicted of second-degree manslaughter for the death of his four-month-old son, whom prosecutors say lived in a filthy and hazardous environment before asphyxiating on a plastic bag. Shockingly, he only served two years behind bars. Authorities were able to obtain low-resolution video of two people throwing Mavis's remains down onto the park trail where she was ultimately found. 
This is why investigators believe Becker, along with another person, were involved in Mavis' murder on the night of May 19th. Becker has pleaded not guilty to first-degree murder and sexually violating human remains and is currently awaiting trial. Her loved ones were relieved to finally see Mavis have a proper burial three months after she was found. Pamela Faye Felkins was born on September 11, 1957. At the age of 32, Pamela was a married mother of two living in Greenbrier, Arkansas, and worked at the Crossroads Video Rental Store. On February 2, 1990, shortly before 9 p.m., Pam's husband, David Felkins, arrived to pick her up. But when he entered the store, it was empty and Pam was nowhere to be found. On the counter was an ashtray with a burning cigarette and a warm cup of coffee, and money was still in the cash register. While Pam was nowhere to be found, her purse, keys, and coat were still in the store. David reported her missing, and a search party was quickly formed to start looking for her. The closest thing to a witness was from a young couple that was leaving the store just as a man entered it around 8.40 p.m., they described him as a tall, heavy-set white male in his 30s or 40s with a tattoo on his left arm. Someone eating at the Wagon Wheel restaurant next door to the video store reported seeing a vehicle around the time of the abduction. It was described as a light blue Chevrolet with a white panel and a white camper shell. Everyone within a 100-mile radius was looking for the truck, but it was never found. Sadly, during a large search the next day, Two of her cousins stumbled upon her body at a dump site in Faulkner County, just a few miles from the video store. An autopsy would reveal that she had been indecently assaulted before being killed. Male DNA was collected from the assault and was used over the years to rule out numerous persons of interest. Authorities received information that led them to a vacant mobile home on Heath Lane in Greenbrier. When asked what led them to that location, Montgomery said they had received several intelligence reports from several sources. An initial suspect was John Mosley, who is a convicted sex offender and is currently serving a 40-year sentence for an indecent assault he committed in 1995. But Mosley's DNA didn't match the sample taken from Pam's crime scene, and he was ruled out. Decades later, in late 2018, a DNA profile was created using new DNA technology and provided to a genetic genealogist. They were able to identify the killer as a former truck driver named Edward Keith Renegar, but Renegar died in Salt Lake City in September 2002 from cancer. So investigators had to seek out his daughter, who provided her DNA and confirmed the match. Renegar, who worked for Burko Manufacturing in Conway from the late 1970s to the early 1990s, had been a frequent visitor of the video store. He served a stint in prison in the 1990s for kidnapping a young woman, brandishing a knife, and tying her up. Thankfully, she escaped, but he only served 10 months in prison for the crime. He also formerly lived in Greenbrier, not far from where Pam was found on Clinton Mountain Road. His daughter told authorities that Renegar had been abusive toward his two ex-wives, and one had a restraining order against him. While Renegar was never brought to justice, at least Pamela's family finally has some closure. Mm -hmm. 